Which Tennessee sports team is going to win a national championship first? Turkey Bowl, Turkey Bowl backyard football. Which five Tennessee football players would be on my team? That and Tennessee in game three of the Hattiesburg Super Regional. That's on the docket here for your Tuesday. Locked on balls. You are locked on balls. Your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome into it. This is Locked On Vols with Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys being here, as always, for making time. Locked On Vols, making it your first listen each and every day. Shout out every dayers for following and subscribing to us on YouTube, Locked On Vols YouTube channel, and wherever you get your podcasts. Again, I'm on the road, as you can see. If you're watching on YouTube, don't have the new bells and whistles. We'll have that when we get back home. But on the road here, covering Tennessee and Hattiesburg, and much like yesterday, it's going to be um, a two-segment show, but I'll try to get it on in the length up to about 25 minutes or so. wanted to make sure that I got you guys something, but uh, just kind of life on the road, right? I- I'm recording segment one prior to game three of the Hattiesburg Super Regional. Of course, if Tennessee wins on Omaha, if Tennessee loses, season over. I will record the second half of this podcast that you're listening to and watching right now uh, later Monday night after the game, win or lose. Just pray that it's not a rain delay, right? Uh, pray that it doesn't get postponed into Tuesday. So that's kind of the rundown here uh, for your Tuesday show. Want to get your Twitter Tuesday questions, mailbag edition of the show, all that and more here in segment number one. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump right into it. We will start with, uh, it's an interesting one. This is from Trevor. Uh, Twitter Tuesday, out of the following teams, which is most likely to win a national championship first, a baseball, men's and women's basketball, football, or softball? Great question, and and again, I'm recording this part of the podcast before we know if Tennessee baseball is going to the College World Series, if it's Omaha bound. But I think I will say, even you know, in that that respect, I, I think I would still go get it, kind of. If I'm ranking these, probably Diamond Sports softball up there. We know how good you know Lady Vol softball can be if you just have a dominant pitcher, and then of course. You know, that roster is filled with, you know, all Americans and players who can hit and everything. Um, baseball is going to be up there simply because the way Tony Botello and Frank Anderson build this roster, you know, with the arms. Um, I think winning a college World Series in, in, in baseball is the hardest thing to do in all of college sports. But the way that this roster is built, it is built to win this time of the year. And again, recording this before game three. Um, so I think those two would be up there, you know, probably softball one, baseball two. I think football would be three, to be completely honest, especially with an expanded college football playoff, um, especially the way Josh Heupel's building this roster. Um, it's not just about getting the Jimmys and Joes anymore. It's about getting the really good Jimmys and Joes. And, of course, we know the, the way that Heupel can scheme up an offense, and they are getting better defensively. With the expanded playoff, with the expanded playoffs coming and uh, kind of the way that Heupel's building this roster, I think football would be three. And then I would put men's basketball four, then lady balls basketball five. There's just so much parity um, in the sports of, of college basketball nowadays. So much of about it is, is who's getting hot at the right time. I mean, look at Florida Atlantic this past year. I uh, got hot at the right time. I mean, there's always a couple of different Cinderella's, you know, who are, are playing the, their best basketball at that point in the stage. And if they're in your region, if they're standing in your way to go to a lead eight or a final four, it could just be, you know, no luck for you on that day. So um, I like the way Rick Barnes is recruiting. I think he's recruiting better than Tennessee basketball ever has. But I think that that's kind of how I would rank those. Um, really, really good question. Appreciate that, Trevor. Uh, let's go on now to Braden. It's Thanksgiving Day. Who are your five players off this year's team you would pick to be on your Thanksgiving Day Turkey Bowl football team to win? Uh, who are the biggest misses in Tennessee football recruiting history? Um, the misses one I'm going to save for another show because I think that's a really, really good topic to do maybe later in this week. But in terms of who would be on my Thanksgiving Day Turkey Bowl team five, we're talking backyard football. All right, we're talking, um, at least in East Tennessee, you know, weather can be whatever it is at any point in time. But, um, childhood Thanksgiving's a little chilly, right? Uh, you're going out there early in the morning, the dew's still on the grass, maybe a little frost kissed, if you will. You're wearing cleats and you're taking your tube socks and you're folding them underneath your cleats to make it look awesome like your guys on All Madden, okay? Um, and then you're just getting the boys out in the neighborhood and and maybe that girl or two that wants to play ball with the boys and you're getting after it. So that's that's kind of what I'm picturing 
in my turkey bowl backyard football if esque. If I'm picking five Tennessee football players, number one, Joe Milton for sure. Okay, backyard football, no one's bringing him down. All right, he's got a cannon. He's the quarterback. That's easy money. Okay, number two, it's probably going to be Dante Thornton. Actually, number two is going to be Squirrel White because he's so quick. He's so elusive. Sure, you can tackle him, but can you catch him in open field? Can you catch him in space? And a lot of time when we're playing backyard football, there's no hashes. There's no there's no true sideline, true end zone. It's just hey, pass that rock, right? Um, Squirrel Y would probably be number two. I'm just thinking these off the top of my head, all right? Number three would be Amari Thomas. Someone's got to block. Someone's got to snap. Someone's got to uh, get after the quarterback. Amari Thomas, he's athletic. I think Amari Thomas could be a dang good offensive tackle uh, for Tennessee and Josh Heupel's offense, but, of course, he plays on the defensive side of the football. Amari Thomas would be my big man, if you will. Uh, My kind of hybrid, if you will, maybe linebacker, edge rusher, guy can get out and cover a little bit. Give me Caleb Herring. Shanavion Bradley's coming in. Caleb Herring's already here in this class. Of course, you got Joshua Josephs. You got James Pierce. I think Caleb Herring, who played a whole lot of linebacker out of the box in high school, um, who has a whole lot of has a whole lot of experience in covering the number two and number three receiver out of the box. A guy that is long, a guy that has put on weight, and I think is going to be a big player here at Tennessee. And I'm excited to see how his role will grow. Um, over the course of of this season, give me Caleb Herring as my fourth guy, if you will. And then lastly, give me a DB, um, also a guy that can catch, a guy that can defend the pass, can also catch. Um, give me, I think Brandon Turnage will be great in backyard football. And I do I think he's a gamer in real life. Maybe Danico Slaughter, I like that as well. But I think Danico Slaughter is at best when he has shoulder pads and a helmet on. Um, but I think br- something about Brandon Turnage kind of gets me thinking, all right, I think he'd be really good in backyard football. So in review, I would go Joe Milton. I would go Squirrel White. I would go Amari Thomas. I would go Caleb Herring. And then I would go Brandon Turnage. I think it's unique because my team would probably look completely different from your team. Uh, kind of how I, I made it. And I kind of went position by position, try to get different body types, all that type of stuff. But here's the thing. If I got Joe Milton and you don't, I'm winning the football game because that sucker's going to run over you. We're playing Oh yeah, we're playing tackle football. We're not playing no flag football or two-hand touch. I mean, come on now. We're going to do this. We're going to do it right. Um, that's that, that that's my team right there. So um, good question. I would love to hear what you guys have to say in terms of who would be on your uh, Turkey Bowl football team. All right, let's go. We got a couple more here. We will go to my bookmarks on Twitter. Got a couple questions. This is from Brian. A couple of football questions. Who does Tennessee lose after this season, counting those who could use a COVID year? All right. Um, this is off the top of my head, and, of course, it changes. And a lot of times we don't even know that it changes, but changes because these guys take classes and they're ahead of the game and all that, and because the COVID year just makes everything so confusing. Joe Milton is out of eligibility after this year. Um, Jabari Small has a COVID year. I'm, I'm thinking of seniors right now. Jabari Small has a COVID year. <clears throat> Cooper Mace has a COVID year. Javante Spragans has a COVID year. Gerald Mincy, J.J. Crawford still have years if they want it. Um, Ollie Lane is done after this year. He's using his COVID year right now. Wide receivers, Brew McCoy has eligibility. Dante Thornton has eligibility. Squirrel White, of course, has eligibility. Ramel Keaton is using his COVID year right now, so he's done. Jacob Warren is done after this year. He's using his COVID year right now. McCallan Castles, his backup. Tied in from the transfer portal, UC Davis. He's done after this year. So those are the big ones. And again, if I didn't mention them, uh, it's because I forgot or because they're not even a senior right now. Um, on the defense side of the football, Maury Thomas technically has a COVID year. Um, let's see here. Uh, of course, all the Leo, Roman Harrison is using his COVID year right now, so he would be out of eligibility. The rest of the Leos would be back if they wanted to. Um, Omar Norman Lott has another year or two. Bryson Eason, I believe, has a COVID year. You got to remember, guys, a lot of these guys will not play that COVID year. Or um, if they have an opportunity to go to the NFL draft, they will go to the NFL draft. I'm just trying to answer the question. Um, Dominic Bailey has has more years, I believe. Let's see here. Tyler Barron has another year, I believe. Yeah, um, I know I'm forgetting some people on the defensive line, but... No, I think those are the seniors. I think those are the seniors right there. Let's go to linebacker. Keenan Peely is out of eligibility after this year. Aaron Beasley 
Let's see here. 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Aaron Beasley, I think was yeah, I think Aaron Beasley technically has another year as well because he was a he was a red shirt. So if he wanted to use that COVID year, he could be a six year guy, if you will. <laughs> um, but Keenan Peely's done, and then everybody else behind them is is underclassmen. Go to the secondary. Jalen McCullough, I believe, has a COVID year. He does. Jalen McCullough has a COVID year. Um, Wesley Walker's done after this year, I believe. Brandon Turnage is done after this year, I believe. Kamal Haddon, I believe, has another year. Um, and then the rest are, are underclassmen. So uh, I hope, the, hope that I just kind of freelance that um, and, and kind of answered off the top of my head. I, I think that I'm not missing it. But Charles Campbell, the new kicker coming in, um, this is his last year of eligibility. Jackson Ross, the punter, can can punt for three more years after this one. So yeah, I hope I hope I answer that question to uh, to your liking there. Uh, number two, which team from the West are you most excited about to see Tennessee return to playing at least once every two years? I know a lot of you guys are going to say Auburn because Tennessee played Auburn every single year. Uh, I think that'd be a whole lot of fun. Um, I know this doesn't mean the West, but I'm really excited about Tennessee playing Texas. I am, and I know that's not SEC West. So I'm just saying I'm really excited about Tennessee playing Texas. I'm excited about Tennessee playing Oklahoma because I have family ties. Uh, my father, you know, was born in Oklahoma and moved here to East Tennessee when he was five. Um, and so I always thought that was kind of interesting seeing Oklahoma play on television. Um, SEC West, though, um, probably Auburn, to, to be completely honest with you, probably Auburn. I like playing LSU. I think LSU is one of the, you know, storied programs in college football. So that would be really, really fun for me. LSU probably is my answer, but I think Auburn would be the answer to the to, to, to most of the people listening right now. Uh, Jason says, "What do you see? Who do you see stepping in as a leader on defense this year? To me, it's Beasley, Peely, or Amari Thomas. Making sense. Interested in hearing your thoughts. Yeah, all three of those guys are going to be counted on to be leaders. Peely's brand new, but he's got to step in and, and play and step in and earn the respect of everybody. But you know, playing linebacker, you've got to be a leader. You're the middle layer of the defense. You got to be a leader. I mean, that just, just kind of comes with the territory. And, and Beasley, he leads by example, and I think he's gotten more vocal a little bit." But he's not the most vocal guy. He's more, you know, watch me work and follow my lead type guy. Amari Thomas, 100% as a leader on the defensive line and for the defense. And, I mean, you know, I know a lot of you guys don't like this, but Jalen McCullough is a leader back there because he's been here forever and they follow his lead. And um, I would say, you know, Wesley Walker's, uh, you know, Warren Burrell as well. They, they've been here a while, so a lot of people just kind of follow their leads. But I think Beasley, Peely, and, and uh, Amari Thomas, great answers for you. Tyler Barron's another name in there, but – you know, some people lead, some people follow, and I think the other three, you know, kind of fit more that category, in my opinion, uh, than Tyler Barron, even though he's a really, really good player. Good, good answer there, and already some, you know, your three were probably the best three I could imagine. All right, let's go to Aaron. This will conclude our mailbag portion of the show, and then we'll talk baseball. Uh, Football-related, do you think Tennessee running back room is getting slept on? I personally think so, and I mean very slept on. I think this year you're going to be amazed, right, and small or good, yes, but I think with what we've seen from uh, Samson last year, is it just the beginning thoughts? And then he goes on to add to this. I feel like Samson doesn't get the amount of touches he feels he's deserved. Then he'll be chomping at the bit with some NIL deals for him to transfer after this season. I hope I'm wrong. And he is a BFL. Well, that's just the nature of college sports that we live in. Right. I mean, Jabari small contemplated. I feel like and it wasn't Jabari small. He, he was hurt this off season, but really it was, it was Jalen Wright that there were some rumors out there that he was going to enter the portal and he got a, a new deal to kind of stay here, if you will. But, um, it's just kind of the air we live in, right? Um, you recruit well, not everybody's going to play. Not everybody's going to be happy. Um, I do to answer your question. I do think Tennessee's running back room top to bottom is solid. I think it's one of the best in the sec. I truly do I think Alabama's is up there. Um, I think that uh, you know Alabama's is definitely up there, and I think that Arkansas is probably up there. I think Tennessee's up there. I do. Um, there's not a star. I think Jalen Wright could be a star. I think Jalen Wright's going to break out this year in a big way. But Jabari Small is a tough runner. He's been here a while. Jalen Wright's a tough runner. He needs more opportunities. Dylan Sampson splash. He needs some more opportunities. Cam Selden should get the ball a couple of times in some certain L packages, uh, personnel packages, hopefully. Uh, we'll see. But, and even Deshaun Bishop had a really good spring. And I, he's not going to play a big role this fall, in my opinion. But, I mean, top to bottom, you got some depth there. And, and that's really, really good. So, we'll see how it all transpires. Guys, I appreciate it as always. Uh, like I said, this first portion of the show, I'm recording before Game 3 of Super Regional Play in Hattiesburg. If Tennessee wins, 
It's on to the World Series. If Tennessee loses, well, it's on to the offseason. When we come back, I will recap what was saw, what was had at Pete Taylor Park in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and tell you all of my thoughts on Tennessee going to Omaha or Tennessee season coming to a close. That is coming up next right here on Locked On Balls. But, hey, uh, I want to tell you guys about a proud sponsor of the show. That is FanDuel Sportsbook. NBA playoffs going on right now. Happened last night. Uh, you can make a fast break during the NBA playoffs at FanDuel Sportsbook. Right now, new customers you can get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That is $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Uh, great promotions every single day, not just on the NBA playoffs, but also um, on Major League Baseball, on NASCAR, on weekends. You guys know that's where I like to make some money. Um, on futures for college football, we talked about win totals all the time right here at FanDuel Sportsbook for the SEC. Tennessee sitting at 9.5. Where do you like that total, over or under? All those futures and everyday stuff, including the no-sweat first bet over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Safe and secure, easy-to-use app where you get paid instantly for your winnings. There's no better place to get in all that NBA action right now, that playoff action, than over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, guys, we got a final segment left here of your Tuesday edition of Locked on Vols. Welcome into it. Um, as I mentioned, as I explained in segment one, I recorded that segment uh, well early in the day. That was before the Tennessee baseball game. That was before another four-hour rain delay. And I said I would record the second half of this podcast, a little two-segmenter, after the game, depending on you know, well, you know what happens with Tennessee baseball. It is the middle of night. I'm in Hattiesburg, Mississippi still, and I'm just trying to get this up there. So if you're watching on YouTube, obviously not the new setup with the bells and whistles. I apologize. But, hey, I got to get something out there, guys. I mean, what? Tennessee's going to Omaha. Tennessee baseball is going to Omaha. This team that was so frustrating to watch play back in February and March, this team that couldn't field a ground ball, this team that made so many base running mistakes, this team that couldn't find an outfield, this team that you know couldn't find infielders that could field your know, ground balls, a, a, uh, a leadoff hitter, so on and so forth. This team is going to Omaha. You know why? It's a testament to Tony Vitello, the way he builds his roster, the way he scouts talent, the way he develops talent. And this team is no different. This team got better and better as the year went on. So I just thought it was really, really neat. Tennessee takes down Southern Miss in a decisive game three of the Hattiesburg Super Regional. Five to nothing, the final score, and the Volunteers are back to Omaha for the first time, or for the second time in three seasons, for the sixth time in program history. 366 days officially. Why? Well, because the game ended in the wee hours of the morning. But essentially a year to the day, Tennessee was crying. Tennessee was heartbroken. Tennessee was upset on its home turf by Notre Dame and the, and the uh, Super Regionals. Tennessee comes back a year to the day in a couple hours and celebrates on an opposing team's field, celebrates by dogpiling behind home behind the pitcher's mound, celebrates by punching its tickets to the College World Series. I just, you know, it's funny how things work out sometimes. It really is. It's interesting how things work out sometimes. And and that's that's what it is here with Tennessee. So now Tennessee's going to Omaha. Tennessee will square off against LSU for the first game of their Omaha, you know, hopefully, which will be an extended stay. It'll be Saturday night at 7 o'clock. Um, we'll get into breaking down the Omaha bracket. We'll get into breaking down the College World Series and all that type of stuff. Stanford won on the one of the most unique ways in ever, right? Not an Arkansas way, but still, you know, those were the two tickets punched, the two final tickets that were punched. Tennessee was the final ticket punched to Omaha. And uh, it was a late one. Over 23 hours of rain delays combined this weekend. It was not fun. And I'm going to record this. I'm going to get all my, my post-game stuff done. I'm going to go back, get a couple hours of sleep, and then 6 a.m. Central Time, I'm heading home. It's going to take me all day, but I'm heading home. But uh, it's going to be a short stay because I'm going to pack a bag, and then I'm going to be off to Omaha. <laughs> so uh, looking forward to it. But, man, 
if you're a baseball fan, you like to see good teams get better, and then you like to see good teams get rewarded for getting better. And that's exactly kind of what this Tennessee t- Tennessee team did this year. And so it, it's been fun to watch. Drew Beam was next level. The curveball was working for him. He was working confidently. He was working ahead of hitters. And uh, he was phenomenal. He really, really was. That's back-to-back starts and postseason play where he has been in complete control. And there's nobody on the planet that was pitching a, a baseball better than Drew Beam at that point in time. That That's kind of the swagger he was walking around with. Uh, season high, 106 pitches, pitched into the seventh inning. And then when you get into a little bit of trouble there, you get the ball to Aaron Combs for a big out. And then you go get the ball to Chase Burns for two big outs. He blew right past Dustin Dickerson with three straight 100-mile-an-hour fastballs to get a big all out. And then he got Slade Wilkes to, excuse me, he got Slade Wilkes to uh, strike out as well to get out of that seventh inning. And Tennessee was able to escape a two-on, no-out jam uh, to preserve Drew Bean's line and to preserve Tennessee's lead at the time. Seventh inning was huge. Maui Huna goes ahead and hits in a, a, an insurance run, and Tennessee wins 5 0. Um, you know, Griffin Merritt was, uh, sorry for the shaky camera. Griffin Merritt was the, uh, you know, reason Tennessee was on the scoreboard first. He muscles a single the other way, and uh, Ahuna's, or Christian Scott, rather, Christian Moore, I'll get her out one day, is able to scoot around and score from second base. Tennessee led one nothing, and the way Drew Beam was pitching, you thought that hey, that might be enough. You knew it wasn't going to be enough, and, and Tennessee had opportunities. Tennessee had guys on, plenty of guys on. They stranded four runners in the span of two innings early on in this baseball game. But Tennessee had a one zero lead. Drew Beam was pitching well, and then Zane Denton, a flair for the dramatics, right? He has five hits in postseason play, four of which have left the yard. Another three run home run gave Tennessee a massive, what felt like a massive. Four to nothing lead there midway through that ball game. Just huge. Just huge. And again, I mean, it was never even close. You know, once that home run happened, it, you just knew Tennessee was going to win. You just knew Tennessee was going to dogpile. And you just knew Tennessee was going uh, back to Omaha. So credit Drew Beam. Drew, Drew Beam. He was really, really good. Credit Chase Burns out of the bullpen. He was incredible. Credit Zane Denton. Credit Griffin Merritt, credit Maui Ahuna, credit Tennessee. A team win, if I've ever seen one, much like it was in game two with their backs against the wall and getting on to Omaha. I mentioned this stat earlier in the week, I believe. 79% of teams that win game one of Super Regional play go on to advance to the College World Series. Tennessee did not win game one of Super Regional play. But with its back against the wall, it won game two, it won game three, and now it's back to Nebraska. So uh, what a fun weekend. It was a very uh, annoying weekend. The NCAA is just, boy, oh, boy, ESPN, television, collaboration with uh, with uh, with the NCAA this weekend was just pathetic. It was the biggest clown show I think I've ever seen. And this is not Southern Miss. Southern Miss... The administration, the people, they've been great. Um, But the game times and the lack of not reading a radar and the not not having the mental fortitude to do what's right to get the games in, but to try to get more viewers in front of a television, absolute pathetic. The biggest clown show I've ever seen in my life down here in Hattiesburg, Mississippi this weekend for the Super Regionals. And when it was not Southern Miss's fault, it was the NCAA and ESPN. Absolutely pathetic. But Tennessee's able to overcome that, able to overcome the weather, and able to overcome a really, really talented baseball team and uh, you know, punch its tickets. And so I'm, I'm really, really excited to see what this team can do in Omaha. We'll have plenty more. I'll, uh, I'll get home and we'll talk more Tennessee baseball. We'll preview the field in Omaha. But for the second time in three years, for the sixth time overall, for the second time under Tony Vitello, and for the first time since 2021, and before that, the first time since 2005, Tennessee is off to the College World Series. And uh, we'll see if Tennessee can be the last team standing and make it out of bracket play and then the College World Series final. Uh, That is coming up, and uh, they'll start playing against LSU on Saturday. Okay, guys, appreciate it. So sorry for all the unorthodox uh, podcasts here to begin the week. But, uh, again, I'll be home, and and we'll get get back to the normal – Normal, normal schedule, the normal layout and all that in my home studio, but I appreciate you guys staying here with me. Follow me on Locked on Balls, subscribing to the channel. As always, shout out to every dayers. 
Uh, thanks so much for your tour to Tuesday questions. All that and more. We'll come back tomorrow and uh, we'll talk again then. This is Locked On Balls.